Pastor. Happy Sabbath. You know, friends, we're told in Testimonies for the Church, volume six, and page number six to one, the perils of the last days are upon us. Do you believe that? Yes, Do you believe that? Yes, I believe it. And we are told that this is a life and death message. And that's what we have come to receive on this Sabbath, a life and death message. What is going to be my choice today? What is going to be your choice today? And as we contemplate the fact that many are crying peace and safety when God says there is no safety, there is no peace in this world. The only peace is in Jesus Christ. And the Bible is clear. For when they shall say peace and safety, then what comes? Finish that. Sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail as a woman with child, and the Bible says they shall what? Not escape. Our only peace and safety is in Christ. In that same statement of volume 6, page 61, we are told, let not the solemn scenes which prophecy has revealed be left untouched. That if our people were half awake, if they understood the nearness of the events portrayed in the revelation, a reformation would be wrought in our churches and many more would believe the message. Friends, we have no time to lose. Do we have much time to lose? We have no time to lose. We are to watch for souls. We are to watch for souls as they that must give an account. How is my soul with Jesus? How is your soul with Jesus? Is my home ready? Is your home ready? Husbands, fathers, God is talking to you. Is your home ready? Have you set and begun to set your house in order? Mothers, wives, God is talking to you. How is it with my soul? Children, young people, how is it with my soul? And we're told all of us will have to give an account before God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. How many of us? All of us. Romans 14 and verse 12, we shall all have to stand before the judgment seat of God. And the question is, how shall I stand? Was that not the song we just saw? The song of meditation, how shall we stand in that great day? Shall I be found wanting or with what? Finish that. With all of our sins washed away. Do you see your need? I see mine. So join me in prayer. Safe to serve international. First time viewers online. Let's spend a few moments in prayer at this time. Father in heaven, it's a privilege to bow in your presence on this, your holy Sabbath day of rest. We praise God that today is the seventh day of the week, your seventh day Sabbath, that you have not changed. Man has attempted to change your Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week to deceive mankind. Thank you for open up, opening up our eyes. And today, we pray for fresh bread from heaven's bakery. Feed us till we want no more. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Grant us Bible repentance. Grant us revival. Reformation is our prayer. Forgive us of our sins 
and we thank you for victory over sin is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. My friends, we are told in the book, The Desire of Ages, and page number 83, that it would be well for us to spend, if you're reading, read this with me. It would be well for us to do what, my friends? To spend a thoughtful hour when? Each day. In contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it how? Point by point. And let the what, friends? The imagination. Grasp each scene, especially the what? The closing ones. And today, we are going to focus on the closing scene of Christ's earthly ministry. And one of those closing scenes is found in Luke chapter 19. Let's go there, my friends. Where are we going to? The closing scene of Christ's earthly ministry began with his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. This was the final seven days of Christ's earthly ministry. How many days, my friends? The final seven days. I want us to write down seven days. And my friends, based on Bible prophecy, what does a day represent? A year. Seven days, seven years. And later on throughout this study, we are going to see, we have come, I believe, to the final seven years of this earth's history. We're going to see it, brothers and sisters. And notice, in Luke chapter 19, look with me at verse number 37. And verse number 38, what were the people crying out? They were crying out, Hosanna. Blessed be he that cometh as a king. Was Christ coming as the king? Was Christ about to be crowned king? Yet what were they preaching? What were they shouting? That Christ is about to be crowned king. Even the disciples were a part of this group. Did they understand Christ's ministry completely ignorant? Did they understand Christ's prophecies ignorant? How would it be in these last days? Look with me, Luke chapter 19. And look with me, my friends, at verse number 37. If you're there, just say amen, my friends. It says in verse 37, uh, they were praising God. Look at verse 38. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. And we are told, just as how they were ignorant of Christ's earthly ministry, ignorant of Bible prophecies that were being fulfilled, at that appointed time, so it is. God's professed people in these last days of earth's history are ignorant of end time Bible prophecies. Great controversy. Page 594 says, so, do you want it? It says, so in the prophecies, the future is open before us as plainly as it was opened to whom? The disciples. By the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation. The work of what, my friends? The work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed 
And the question is, am I in that multitude? The question is, are you a part of that multitude? Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation. It says, and the time of trouble will find them how, brothers and sisters? will find them unready. I don't want to be in that group. How about you? Notice now, in verse number 39, what did the leaders of the Jewish people say to Christ to do with his disciples? He says, rebuke the disciples. Shut them up from what they are preaching. And my friends, it's going on today. What are many leaders within our movement saying when prophecies are being expounded upon? Current events are being focused on as fulfilling Bible prophecies. They say these preachers need to be silenced. These preachers are offshoots. These preachers are alarmists. These preachers are fanatics. But what did Christ say in verse 41? If these should hold their peace, what did Christ say? The stones, yes, would immediately cry out. What was Christ saying? He will have preachers pro proclaiming the present truth of this final generation. I want to be one of those voices. Do you want to be one of those voices? And look at verse 41. The Bible now says that Jesus... As he drew near to the city, as he beheld his professed people in Jerusalem, the Bible says that Jesus what? Jesus wept. Why was Christ weeping? Was he fearful of the cross? Why was he weeping? Because his professed people were blind. His professed people were willingly ignorant. His professed people were unprepared for the crisis at the cross. His professed people were about to reject him. His professed people were about to accept Barabbas and to shout, Crucify Jesus Christ. The Zaref Ages said that. Look at great controversy and page number 18. Are we there, my friends? He wept for whom? The doomed thousands of Jerusalem because of the what, friends? The blindness and impenitence. We know what blindness means. But what does impenitence mean? Impenitence means unrepentant. So why did Christ weep? Oh, brothers and sisters, is Christ weeping today? It says, watch carefully, brothers and sisters, blue words, the loss of even one soul is a calamity infinitely outweighing the gains and treasures of a world. But as Christ looked upon whom? Where? Jerusalem. The doom of a whole city, a whole nation. Jesus wept. Last sentence, red words. Christ saw in Jerusalem a what, brothers and sisters? A what? A symbol of the world. 
Just as they were blind, as they were willingly ignorant of who Christ was, end time prophecy, Christ's mission, the majority of God's professed people today are also in the same spiritual degradation. Wake up, brothers and sisters. And Christ explains why he wept. Go to verse 42 of Luke chapter 19. Are we there, my friends? Have you ever seen a trench, dog? Anybody? What's a trench? A what? A boat? A moat? What's a trench? Thank you. What else? A trench, a ditch. What else? Now tell me, back in the day, not far back in the day, in Orlando, when we pitched that tent right there off Kirkman Road, that massive blue and white tent several years ago, we had to dig a trench around the tent. Do you know why? It was summertime. What happens in Orlando during summertime? So what was rain? So what was the trench for? To catch the water as it would roll off the tent, the canvas, and the water had a path to travel, in other words, hindering the flood, the rain, the flood from inundating under the tent where people would sit. A trench, it keeps water out. A trench keeps people out. Look at verse 42 with that in mind. Why did Christ wept? Verse 42, are we there? Saying, if thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. Let's read now. But now, oh, but now, they are what? They are hid from thine eyes. What does that mean? They were blind. And secondly, a time is going to come. We won't have the opportunity to discern truth. To discern truth. Verse 43. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine whom thine enemies shall cast a what now? Shall cast a what now? A trench about thee. Watch now. And compass thee round. Listen. And keep thee in. And what now? So what was the purpose of that trench? To keep you in. On how many sides? If they lock you in on one side, you can go to another exit. No, keep you in on how many sides? On every side. Mm -hmm. What's a trench? There it is, brothers and sisters. The trench, a ditch, by the way. The actual word trench in the Bible is connected to a military takeover. It's right there. A military barricade. None go in, none go out. Look at verse 44. Are we there? Verse 44 now says, watch carefully, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. Because, let's read now, thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. So why was Christ weeping? They did not know the time, the signs of the times. But were those signs clear? They were willfully ignorant. And as it was at the first advent, how should it be just before the second advent of Jesus Christ? 
They don't understand the time of their visitation. Was that prophecy fulfilled? Under which Roman general? His name was Titus in the year AD 70. The Titus set a trench around Jerusalem. Could anyone exit Jerusalem? No. No. Did they perish in Jerusalem? But before Titus descended upon Jerusalem and set a trench around Jerusalem, who came in the year A.D. 66? Approximately three and a half years earlier, what was his name? Cestius. But brothers and sisters, when Cestius surrounded Jerusalem, what happened supernaturally? He retreated. And some faithful Christian, they saw what could have happened. They saw what should have happened. And they fled. Why? Because they saw what will happen. Because the prophecy said, it will transpire. But the majority said, mere alarmist. They scoffed at the prophecy. They mocked the prophecy. They said that this would never take place. The Bible and history confirm they remain in Jerusalem. What happened when Titus came, brothers and sisters? Look at the screen. There it is. The first sentence, Cestius surrounded Jerusalem. It's right there. Last sentence, the faithful Christians, they took their flight. But now notice, when Cestius retreated, red words on top, who came next? Titus. What happened, brothers and sisters? We are told that Jerusalem was destroyed. And all the professed people of God who remained in Jerusalem were also destroyed. And why? Because they knew not the time of their visitation. And what was so remarkable is this. What transpired in Jerusalem had transpired years before. History was repeating. Go to Deuteronomy with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Deuteronomy chapter 28. Look with me carefully. Was there another power that destroyed Jerusalem? What was his name? Nebuchadnezzar. Of what country? What nation? Babylon, brothers and sisters. Look with me. Deuteronomy 28. Are we there, my friends? Look with me at verse number 56. If you're there, just say amen. amen. The tender and delicate woman, woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness, and tenderness, her eyes shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward the son, and toward her daughter, and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet. What were they doing, my friends? They were eating their children in order to get food. Read on, read on. For she shall eat them. What, friends? She shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the what now? In the siege. And what? Straightness. Wherewith? Then what now? It's the same words of Luke 21. Thine enemy shall distress thee in the gates. Go to lamentation. Chapter 4, where are we going to, my friends? My friends, what am I saying? What happened during the destruction of Jerusalem 
by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was repeated in AD 70. That's two witnesses. And Jesus said, the destruction of Jerusalem typifies the destruction of what? The world. Oh, brothers and sisters, will this be repeated? Yes, it will. And right now, Jerusalem, God's professed people, have already been surrounded. But many people are scoffing at the prophecy. Yes. They mock the preaching of present truth. They ridicule these messages. They call us men who are crying wolf. Lamentations, chapter 4. Have you ever seen someone so skinny, meager, that their skin hangs from their bones? It happened. It's coming again. Lamentations, chapter 4. Look with me at verse number 8. If you're there, just say amen, my friends. The second part of verse 8 says, Their skin cleaveth to their what? Their bones. The skin is withered. The skin is become like a stick. So meager. The Bible says they look like a stick. Look at verse 9. They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with what? Hunger. That's it. For these pine away, stricken through for want of the fruits of the field. Verse 10. The hands of the pitiful woman have cooked have boiled, have steamed, barbecued, french fried, curried their own children. Ketchup and pepper sauce on the bodies of their children. All because when the signs came, that, look, we are being surrounded. The signs are here. We can buy. We can sell. And because some of these signs have somewhat retreated. Many are saying it will never happen. But the Bible says you will eat your children in the coming crisis. The young will kill the elderly. And eat them for food. During the destruction of Jerusalem, the history said that people were eating their belt, eating their sandals to get food. As if belt and sandals can nourish the body. It's coming again, brothers and sisters. Look at the screen here. Ah, September 24th. What says the headline here, friends? How many, of you, how many of you shop at Costco? Whether presently or you did. It says Costco limits what? Purchases on paper goods. Even on water. Key items amid what, friends? Supply chain. The supply chain delays. The very ones who claim to be able to solve these problems are the same ones who are creating the crises. The Hegelian dialectic. Create the crisis and then present the solution. Order out of chaos. And this is now my opinion. Great controversy, page 589. While acting as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring disease and disaster until 
populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. What if there's no food at the grocery store? How would you survive? The trench is being dug. And the majority of God's professed people don't understand the time of their visitation. Jesus is weeping. Look at this, brother. Look at this. BP. Do you know BP? The gas station? Closes. UK. Gas stations due to what? Truck shortages. Do I have order back there? Truck shortages. Now what do trucks do? Do they transport gasoline, fuel, food, commodities? All right. It, sa it says uh, empty. Look at this, my friends. Empty yesterday. Empty supermarket shelves. And panic buying. <laughs> Unless urgent action from government food suppliers are warning. The trench is being dug. But many are saying, we have seen this before. And that means the crisis of no buy and no sell, except you on a Sunday worship by law, will never, ever take place. The same thing they said when Cestius retreated. And here comes Titus. What do armies back then ride? And what says Jeremiah 12? If the footmen have wearied thee, how will you contend with the horses? Cestius, the footmen. What we're seeing now, the footmen. But oh my friends, Titus is coming. The horsemen are on their way. Yet God's people are crying, peace, peace. When God says there is no peace, there is war. Shop early. Why shop early? Look at why shop early. Pandemic will make toys, food, scarce when this holiday season. The trench is being dug. Blue words at the bottom. The shipping container that cost $3,000 last year is now $22,000. How much percent? What was the increase based on the percentage here? From $3,200 to $22,000. Cestius is here. Titus is on his way. All right, my friends. Brace yourself. Should I read this, my friends? It's going to be hard to find everything. Not just your favorite holiday foods and hot toys and gifts, but also basic staples like coffee and footwear. Won't spend time on that. We don't drink coffee. Because of supply chain problems, that will likely persist at least until December 2021. Is that what it said? Until when? Next year, spring. But oh, says the scoffers, that's just rumors. Rumors one day. The rumors will become a reality. It says the global supply chain is so broken that only the biggest stores, that needs to be underlined. Do you know what monopoly means? Do you know what monopoly means? And don't tell me just a board game. Because that board game is being played out today. It's so broken, 
that only the biggest stores will be able to obtain and store sufficient what? Sufficient inventory. And nobody can predict how long the situation will last. The bottom line is this, what I hope consumers have already started to do is what, my friends, is shop. What is God telling us? It's time to prepare. Uh, Proverbs, not Psalms, Proverbs chapter 6, consider the ant. What does the ant do that we must consider? The ant stores up for the time of rain, a time of want, a time of crisis. And the world is saying it's time to prepare, shop, Tore up, but God's people are saying peace and safety while the trench is being dug all around us. Another massive shortage of what? What do you wipe your rear with where the sun does not shine? Another massive shortage of toilet paper. But some are going to say, it happened in 2020. Rumors. You see, I, I, I went back to the store and the shelves were all stocked with toilet paper. Andrew Henriquez, shut up and take your seat. This too shall pass. That's what they're saying. But what says the prophecy, brothers and sisters? It says, red words, if Costco is alerting shoppers, let's read that, it means it's a crisis across the United States of America. Product shortages, as bad as they were in the beginning of the pestilence 19 crisis, COVID, our what, friends, are coming back. Cestius is here. Do you see my brother? Do you see it? And Titus is on his way. Give me some audio, preacher. Listen attentively. Less choice and higher prices. That's the warning for Queenslanders this Christmas. Lockdowns, border closures and a global supply chain crisis means there will be a shortage of almost everything from gifts to groceries. From what? The headline, grocery store shortages. Parents struggle to find lunchables, juice boxes and school snacks. Let me tell you something. If you want to destroy a country, militarily cut off their supplies. I've watched many documentaries of army men, marines in Vietnam, Korea, etc., in the jungles, and as they call for reinforcement, food, and ammunition, what if the enemies did? To sabotage, try to destroy their supply chain. <laughs> destroy their supply chain. And they will crawl and beg you and they will surrender. Monopolize, control, food, commodities, supplies, and the people will bow to receive food. It is Satan's devilish plan. The trench is being dug all around us. Kamala Harris, listen. Grocery store shortages comparable to 2020. Are you what? Are you what? Are you prepared for lack of supply? Are you prepared? Audio preacher back there. Thank you, preachers. Listen. My name is Shen Shen Lei. I'm the...
volume. My name is Shen Shen Lei. I'm the CEO of the American Chamber of Commerce in Singapore, and I will be your moderator for this roundtable. The, the stories that we are now hearing about um, the caution that if you want to have Christmas toys for your children, it might now be, might be the time to start buying them because the delay may be many, many months. So across the board, um, people are experiencing the issue. And of course, the climate crisis is fueling um, a lot of this. When we look at the stronger typhoons that have disrupted shipping lanes and uh, sea level rise, which has a, it threatens uh, port infrastructure, as an example. Um, so these are the many issues that are, that are causing these disruptions. What did she blame? Climate change. It's a question. What is going to be the solution? It's right there, friends. Sunday, rest by law. Labor shortage, not just closing small businesses. Labor what? They can't find workers. Not only are they blaming climate change for the crisis, but they're also blaming people who have not received the pestilence 19 inoculation, but shattering entire retirement plans. New York Hospital, won't watch friends, deliver babies after whom? So my friends, what is the solution? Has God given to us the solution? The solution, my friends, is to flee to the country. Luke chapter 21. Go there with me, my friends. It's coming. The trench is being dug. And those who saw Cestius retreat, the faithful Christians, they fled. They fled where? They fled to another city? Huh? When Cestius retreated, when they saw what could have been total shutdown, what should have been, what did they do? They fled, they fled to where? Not to another city. They fled to the mountains, the country, the rural district, Luke chapter 21. We are told, my friends, in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 24, that there were 12 tribes in Israel. But there was one tribe called Issachar, men who understood the times, men who knew what Israel ought to do. Where are those men today? The trenches are being dug. Who understand the times? And what Israel, God's professed people, even SDA people, ought to do. Mm -hmm. Luke 21. Look at verse 20. And when you shall see what? Jerusalem. Compassed with armies. Then guess. Then what, friends? Then know that the desolation thereof is far away. It's nigh. Verse 21. Let them which are weary in Judea flee to the mountains. Those who are without do not come back in. Verse 22, why? Verse 22, for these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written might be fulfilled. Mothers with young babies, fathers with young babies. Verse 23, but woe unto them. Woe unto them which are with child and give suck in those days. The woe is not for the obedient. The woe is for the disobedient. 
Not woe for those who are fleeing with young ones. There's no woe for you. The woe, my friends, is for those who refuse to understand the signs of the times. Isaiah 49 confirms. Verse 24 and verse 25. Let's read on, verse 24, and they shall be, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive. What does captive mean? You're in bondage. Look at this, my friends, volume 5, page 400. And 64 says, the time is not far what? Distant. Listen. When, like the whom? The early disciples, we, why wait until you are forced? We shall be what? Forced to seek a refuge where? In desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so, brothers and sisters, the assumption of power on the part of our nation in that decree, enforcing the papal Sabbath, Sunday Sabbath, will be a what? A warning to us. It will then be time to lead the large cities. Preparatory to leave in the smaller ones. For retired homes in the secluded places among the mountains. Some people say that statement means just wait until the Sunday law is enforced to move to the country. That's the last call for those who didn't have the window of opportunity, the door of opportunity, open until that time. The time has been to flee. It says, and now, instead of seeking expensive dwellings. What does that mean, my friends? Here, we should be preparing to move to a better country, even we're. Brothers and sisters, is it time? We must understand the times and what God's people are to do. This is no joke. Just before Jerusalem was destroyed by Titus, we are told that there was a man. For seven years. How long? And how many days spanned Christ's last moments on earth since the triumphal entry into, into not, not Jamaica, into Jerusalem on that donkey, seven days. He was preaching for seven years. Whoa, whoa, the signs of the end. For Jerusalem are here. Get ready, get ready, get ready. But the historical record said that seamen died in the siege he prophesied about. And the next sentence, Sister White says, not one Christian died, perished, in Jerusalem. What does that mean? Come on, what does that mean? Hmm? What does that mean? It's more than just preaching. It's more than simply talking about these things. 
It's more than lip service. We need heart service. Going beyond theory, we need practical steps. It means you can be talking about these things and still be lost. For seven years? Do you know what's striking, my brother? What was Sabbath school about? Evangelists. Jared, Richard. What was Sabbath school about, preachers? Come on, class. The first what? The first whoa. Fifth trumpet. Do you know what the man was preaching in Jerusalem? Whoa. He was preaching a whoa message. Yet was lost in the same woe that he proclaimed. Great controversy. There it is. For seven years, a man continued to go up and down, up and down, up and down the streets of Jerusalem, declaring the woes that were to come upon the city. Oh, my friends, a voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds. Destruction is coming from all four corners. I wonder if he was preaching Luke 21, Luke 19, and verse 43. Your enemies shall cast a trench about thee to keep thee in on how many sides? On every side from the four corners. Blue words in the middle. This strange being was imprisoned and scourged, but no complaint escaped his lips. But why put yourself in that predicament to be captured? When all the Christians fled after Titus, Retreated. So what was he doing there? Oh, Cestius. So Thank you so much. So what was he still doing there? The sign had come that their probation had already been closed. To insult and abuse, he answered only. Woe! Woe to Jerusalem! Woe! Bowed to the inhabitants thereof. His warning cry ceased not until he was what? Red words. He was slain in the siege he had foretold. Next sentence. Not one whom. One more time. Not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. So who was he? Who was he, brothers and sisters? Hmm. So what is God saying to us for seven years? I believe we have come to the final seven years of this earth's history. I believe Sometime between the year 2020 and the year 2031, you find the last seven years of this earth's history. Now, surely, 2020 to 2031 is not seven years. What I'm saying, between that time, that decade, you'll find the final seven years. Of this earth's history, I believe we will see us under law within that, within that time period. I believe it, friends. I believe it. Look at the screen. I covered this in March of this year. How long will the plan of redemption continue for? 6,000 years. A second quote, 6,000 years again. That's all, friends. That's all. 
and the last thousand years we spend where? In heaven. All right. When Christ died on Calvary's cross, how many years had passed since man sinned? 4,000 years. 4,000 years. And what date was Christ crucified? I'm telling you, my friends. Between 2020 and 2031, we will find the final seven years. That's Bible and Spirit of Prophecy. Watch this. But we are told, time has not been a test since 1844. And it will never again be a test. I'm not setting a date. I'm giving you a time period. Get ready. And by the way, you can die the next moment. Am I ready? Are you ready? Do you think the way how things are going on in this world, this world can last for 20 more years? You, you are deluded if you believe that. The final years are here. Now watch. Watch. What date have the UN set to solve all world problems? What year? Red words at the bottom. What, what year they set? The year 2030. Do you think they're moved by Satan? Yes. Do you think the devil wants to wait until 2030? Satan, if he had a choice, would not wait until 2030. Why? That's more time allotted for people to receive present truth, become converted, and get others converted. Satan wants to shut things down right now. Revelation chapter 12, verse number 12, the Bible says, Satan, rejoice ye that dwell in heaven, and ye that dwell there, but woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. Why? The devil, the dragon, is come down upon you. Why? With great wrath. Why? Because he knoweth. That he has, but a what? Long time? A short time. So praise God, things have been delayed a little longer. 2030, move on. And who was behind the Paris Climate Agreement? Who? The Pope. Of boom, past that. Jesuits add their voice to the climate change policies. Jesuit says, We have our deal. And what is the purpose of Jesuitism? To overthrow Protestantism, liberty of conscience, and Establish, re-establish papal supremacy. Listen to the Pope on climate change. Red alert, blue words at the bottom. What year have they set? What year have they set? 2030, brothers and sisters. I believe. We have come to the final decade. The what, friends? The what? The final decade of this earth's history. If you knew that Monday you will die, how would you live today? Solemn thought. How would you live tomorrow? What would be your thoughts right now? How would you treat your wife? How would you treat your husband? How would you treat your children? How would you treat your sibling? Do you know 
that two won't die on Monday? Look at this. What are they blaming for climate change? The principal thing. Look at the red, uh, the black words on the line red. What are they blaming primarily for climate change? They are blaming human activity. So how are they going to solve it since climate change is caused by human activity? Human inactivity or human rest. Rest on what day, brothers and sisters? The final decade is here. The trench is being dug. I cover that during midday power surge. Past that. Come on now. Sunday. Look at this. What says the Pope? What is their plan? A seven-year plan. What is this year? 2021? What's seven plus 2021? 2028. And what will they do on the final seventh year? A sabbatical year for the earth. Earth must rest. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I believe with all my heart we have come to the final seven years of this earth's history. I'm not guessing. What happened in chapter 41 of Genesis? Was there a dream by Pharaoh? What did Pharaoh dream about seven years? Do you recall, my friends? He saw seven fat cows and seven meager, slim, skinny cows. And what did Joseph say? For the interpretation, seven years of plenty. But what will follow? What will follow? Hmm? Seven years of famine. Such a famine. The seven years of plenty will be forgotten. And did it come? I want to ask you a question, friends. Have we come to that time? The seven years of famine since pestilence 19 broke. The supply chain is so broken. Hear me. The same people who created the supply chain. The same people who oversee the supply chain. The merchants. The bankers, can they break that same supply chain? To fulfill the agenda of the Pope? Fulfilling Revelation 18, verse 2 and verse 3, that the merchants are in bed with Babylon, the papacy? Genesis 41, chapter 45. What happened? Did money fail? Did money fail the last seven years? Since money failed, it means the banks failed. So what can we expect now? Banks are going to fail. What now? Foreclosures are going to escalate. Just wait. And for those of us in debt, you'll become a slave to the lenders. What happened in chapter 47 of Genesis? Did they sell their body to get food? Did they sell their land to the government to get food? In other words, they became paupers. But the Bible says in verse 22, only the land of the priest, the priest bought 
Egypt not. Why? The priests were dwelling where? In the country. Where should we be dwelling now, friends? Look at verse 21. And as for the people, Pharaoh moved them to where? The cities. Look at the screen. The U.S. could default by mid-October. What does that mean, my friends? Default. Money fail. Banks fail. It says America could default by mid-October, says a Washington think tank, leading to what? A cataclysmic financial crisis that could cost how many jobs? Six million jobs. But remember, America, the U.S. dollar is the reserve currency of the whole world. If America defaults on her debt payment, what will happen globally? A financial meltdown. Worse than 1929. Can they do it, friends? Look with me at Luke 21. Can they do it? And what would they call for? To bring back temporal prosperity? What would they call for, friends? To bring back temporal prosperity? A Sunday law to return to temporal prosperity. And the Pope said the same, Sunday, rest by law to care for the poor. My friend, in the final seven days of Christ's earthly ministry, he warned us to stay clear of a sneer. And what was that sneer? Financial debt. What am I saying? In order to endure the pestilence 19 policies, get jabbed in order to work. No jab, no job. If you are not in debt, you can say keep your job. I'm standing for liberty of conscience. But for those who are swimming in financial debt, for those who have been inundated in debt, will have to bow that knee. Here's my arm. Just to earn a dollar. Sneer. First Timothy, go there with me, my friends. Issachar understood the times and what Israel ought to do. Where are we going to? Look at verse 6. It says, but godliness with contentment is what, friends? What does that mean? But godliness... With contentment is what? Great gain. Amen? Skip on down. Verse 7. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry how many things out of it? Nothing. Verse 9. Verse 8. And having food and raiment, let us there, therewith, be content. Do you have food stored up? Do you have food on your property? Come to verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and what? And a sneer. 
Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which was some comforted after they have erred from the thief and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And Christ said in Luke 21, take heed lest your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. For as a sneer shall it come upon all that dwell upon the earth in order to be prepared for the Sunday Lord time period you have to shun debt financial debt as you would leprosy mm -hmm. in order to withstand the pestilence 19, draconian, devilish policies. If you don't go along, we will fire you. You have to shun financial debt as you would the small parts. One reason why many people are bowing the knee to Caesar's magic bullet, Babylon's elixir, is because they're in financial debt. And they will justify with their reasoning why nothing is wrong. It's not the mark of the beast. Why? For many of them. Why? Because they're in financial debt. Are you seeing this, brothers and sisters? And those who are in financial debt, it means you have been inflicted by leprosy. What, pastor? Yes, leprosy. America runs on what? Have you ever seen the slogan for coffee and donut? What is that place called? Coffee and donut shop? Orange and red, I believe. America runs on what? Huh? America is drunk on Dunkin' Donuts and coffee. America runs on Dunkin'. That's the slogan. Dunkin' Donuts. But now, what says this headline? America runs on credit. Brothers and sisters, credit score. Listen, to buy a cell phone for some people, they check your credit for some plans. To buy whatever, clothes and a home, to get a... It, it all resolve, revolve around credit. Which in some respects points to debt. The system of America has been designed to keep the people in what? Financial debt. Even if you have the money to buy a car, a house, some places say, no, 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 you have to allow us to run your credit score. America runs on credit. And the people run into financial debt. America runs on credit. And God's professed people run into debt. And the Bible says... In Proverbs 22 and verse 7, 
the borrower is servant to the lender. What does servant mean? The borrower will serve the lender. Serve also means to worship. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 through verse 10, the third temptation from Satan to Christ, all these things will I give unto you. If you fall down and worship me, Jesus says, get thee hence. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shall thou serve. Amen. The borrower will serve, worship the lender. The trench has already been dug to keep us in financial debt. It's a sweet drowning. You pour water in your nostrils, you can drown. You pour honey in there, you can drown too. It's a sweet drowning though. God's people, God's preachers must understand the times and what Israel ought to do. What am I telling you? Get out of financial debt. You can travel to many churches, and this is not emphasized at all. Because the leaders themselves are in financial debt. They themselves are coveting the things of this world. When boss man tells you, do this or else, and that thing goes against your morals, you say, boss man, you can keep that. I will serve the Lord my God. Amen. Him only will I worship, not man. Amen. Don't raise your hand. How many of you right now are drowning in financial debt? How many online are drowning in financial debt? If you are in financial debt, you are unprepared for the Sunday law crisis. And the pestilence 19 devilish policies show you're unprepared. Oh, but we can write an exemption letter, a religious exemption letter. But how many employers are rejecting them? What will you do next? When 99% when of the companies are requiring the pestilence 19 panacea, where will you go? The trenches are being dug, dug, dug all around us. You can't see it, brothers and sisters. But those who are in the country, those who are converted, those who are not in financial debt, you'll be able to endure the crisis longer than your counterparts who are drowning in financial debt. What I'm going to say right now will not be exhaustive. But I believe the point is going to be made. Once I get to the screen, we have young people. They go to college and they run up the credit card bill. How are they going to pay it off? I mean, student loans drowning. How are they going to make it in these last days? How can they ever become self-sufficient, self-supporting? How? You tell me, how? It's a trap. It's a sneer. Look at the screen, my friends. Let's read. When one 
voluntarily becomes involved in debt. He's entangling himself in one of Satan's nets, which Satan sets for his soul. Brothers and sisters, Satan is setting a net for souls. A net is also a cage. And we can preach all we want. Revelation 18, it rolls off our tongues. Verse 2, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird, while we ourselves are in Babylon's cage, Babylon's net, Satan's net. Many poor families are poor because they spend their money as soon as they receive it. Is that you? When one becomes involved in debt, he is in one of Satan's nets, abstracting and using money for any purpose before it is earned. It's a what? It's a sneer. What does that mean? Not only you're spending above more than your income, but you have already, have you ever done layaway? Huh? Hmm? You began to barter your paycheck for the next two weeks on a product you haven't received the paycheck yet. What if you get sick and can't work the next week? To get that check, you're in a sneer. Everybody, first sentence, what it says. Red words. We should what? We should shun debt as we should shun what? The leprosy. Anybody here wants COVID-19? <laughs> but you run right into debt. Both are a pestilence, a virus that kills. Shun the incurring of debt as you shun, you should shun leprosy. Oh, no man, what? Romans 13. Be determined never to incur. Another debt. Deny yourself, what friends? A thousand things rather than run in what? Debt. This has been the curse of your life. Getting into debt. Let's read. Avoid debt as you would what? The smallpox. Pain. Avoid financial debt as you would the smallpox. Financial debt has become a curse. Listen, have you ever seen some people, they prey on the ignorant in the church? They prey on the elderly to borrow money? And they have no desire to repay their debt from the elderly. And the young, those who are ignorant, it says, you are a robber. Your freedom in borrowing with no reason to suppose that you will be in a position to repay it is doing great injustice to others. What are you doing? You are robbing them. Christian robbers, isn't that something? And bringing reproach 
upon the cause of God. If you realized what you were doing at the time of your action, you would stop. You would see the sinfulness of robbing men, believers or unbelievers, robbers in the church. Are you guilty? And what did Christ call the Jewish leaders? You have made my house a den of thieves. You bring a reproach upon the cause by locating in a place, let's say Orlando, Florida, where you indulge laziness for a time. And then you are obliged to run in debt for provision for your family. These are your honest debts. You are not always particular to pay, but instead you move to another church. Let's say California now. You move to another church and you keep up the same robbery. Could you please lend, uh, please give me a loan? I paid back and you never paid back. You are a robber in God's eyes. This is, red words underlined, this is what? Defrauding your neighbor. Redeem every pledge, blue words. Unless sickness lays you prostrate, better deny yourself what, my friends? Food and sleep than be guilty of keeping from others their just dues. What does Sister White mean? Prefer to lose sleep. Get up early in the morning, even while the stars are shining, and say, Lord, give me victory over robbing people, asking people for loans with no intention to repay. The man who has been unfortunate and finds himself in debt should not take the Lord's portion to cancel his debts to his fellow men. Pastor, can I use God's tithe? Well, that's not how they ask it. Pastor, can I use my tithe to pay my debt? My response, it's not your tithe. The tithe is the Lord's. Listen, don't do that. The man should consider that in these transactions he's being tested and that in reserving the Lord's portion for its own use, he's what? Robbing God, the giver. He is a debtor to God for all that he has. Let's read. But he becomes a double debtor. A what, friends? A double debtor when he uses the Lord's tithe and offering in paying debts to human beings. A Double debtor, a double sinner, a double robber, a double thief. Listen, unfaithfulness to God is written against his name in the books of heaven. The man who will rob God, listen to this is cultivating traits of character that will what? That will cut him off from 
admittance into the family of God. We're above. What does that mean? You will be lost. Shun that as you would leprosy. The smallpox. Stop borrowing. Live within your means. Volume 1, page 5, 4, 2. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Here is the secret of success. The real prosperity for both soul and body. Say it with me. Godliness with contentment is what, my friends? Finish it. Great game. Listen. Every week, you should lay by in some secure place five or ten dollars not to be used up unless you get sick. How many of you do that? Five or ten dollars. That's not much. Little is much. The song says, when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. Do you remember the widow with Elijah? One meal, what happened? When she gave God first, a miracle was what? She had food for one whole year. With economy, you may place something at interest because some people don't like to work. But they prey on church people and they say, you are not a Christian because you won't give me a loan. The next time someone has the unmitigated God, the audacity to say that to you, tell them, this is not the people come on good. <laughs> Go tell the Pope that. Blue words. With wise management, you can save something after paying your debts. I have known a family receiving how much money, friends? Twenty dollars a week to spend every single penny of this amount while another family of the same size maybe four three five six seven receiving less how much twelve dollars a week lay aside one or two dollars a week managing to do this by refraining from what Purchasing things which seemed to be necessary, but which could be what? Dispensed with. Stop satisfying your lust and your want. Satisfy your needs. You are not an ambulance. Wah, 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 wah. I wah. You are not an ambulance. Wah, 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 wah. Just your needs. Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all of your wah, wah, is want, no, all of your needs. According to his riches in glory by the man Christ Jesus. How many of you like porridge? I don't like porridge. I don't like porridge. I like porridge, but I don't like it runny and thin. I like it thick so I can chew it. Mm. And I can sprinkle some of my goodies inside there, fruits and some other things. Yeah. 
but you can't feast on porridge every day. But in order to shun debt, if you only can afford to buy cereal and eat cereal every day, do it so you can shun financial debt. It says, how many of you ate cereal this morning? Don't raise your hand or porridge. Make a solemn covenant with God that by his blessing, you will pay your debts and then owe no man anything. Let's read. If you live on porridge and bread, now I can say your bread and your waters shall be sure. Now I can say your bread and your porridge shall be sure to get out of financial debt. Hillary, tomorrow's on porridge? Amen, honey. Listen. Have you ever seen a big ship? Do you know a small hole can sink the largest ship? Watch this. Take care of the pennies. And the dollars will what? Take care of themselves. It, make, it takes pennies to comprise, make up a dollar. All right. It is the mites here and the mites there that are spent for this and spent for that and spent for the other that soon run up into dollars. Deny yourself. At least while you are walled in. I like that. You're walled in with debts. You're surrounded. You put yourself in a trench. Debt walled in. Work them off. How fast? As fast as possible. Listen. When you can stand forth as a free man again, owing no man anything, you will achieve, you will have achieved a great what? Victory. Let's read. The smallest leak has sunk what? Many a ship. I close. How much better is this plan than for students to go through school? Red words. And at the end of their course, Leave on the what? A burden of debt. So what would God say to Oakwood University? Southern Adventist University. Andrews and the rest who don't have a system for the children, students to come in and leave debt free. But they leave burdened with financial debt. Is that God's order? It's Satan's plan. I remember even as freshmen coming in, they had the loan people on the campus to sign you up. Stafford Loan. You remember Stafford? Who is Stafford, by the way? It says, how hard, blue words, it will be for them to meet the financial problems that are connected with pioneer work in foreign, foreign lands. That's why many of our young people cannot become missionaries. Why? They are drowning with student loan debt. Red word. And what a burden someone will have to carry until the debts incurred by the student have been what? Have been paid. I could say so much on that, my friends. Listen, the land, the land boom has cursed this country. Are we living now in a buyer's market for homes or a seller's market? Which one? A seller's market. Be careful. What country property you buy? Be careful if you have to take out a loan for it. 
Because when the market crashes, you are in trouble, brothers and sisters. It says, extravagant prices for homes and land have been paid for to buy lands bought on what? Credit. Then the land must be cleared. <laughs> and more money is hired. A house to be built costs for more money. And then what? Interest with open mouth swallows up all the profits. Debts accumulate. And then come what? The closing. Foreclosure. The closing and failure of banks. And then the foreclosure of mortgages. Thousands have been turned out of employment. Families lose their little all. They what? They borrow and borrow and then have to give up their property and come out how? Penniless. Now there are a few instances we have to mortgage something, credit something, but you know how you're going to pay for it. You know how. But the majority of us don't do it. It's a sneer. Listen. Now the case where a man owns his place clear is a happy exception to the rule. Merchants are failing. Families are suffering for food and clothing. No work presents itself. Poor men will invest their last shilling in a lottery gambling, hoping to secure a prize. And then they have to beg for food to sustain life or go hungry. Many die of hunger and many put an end to their existence. What does that mean? They commit suicide. The next sentence says, the answer is in country living and growing your own food. My last words. Some of us are in financial debt so deep, we don't see how we're going to get out of it. My first words, do not become discouraged. Look at getting out of financial debt as getting out of a spiritual debt. Do we owe a spiritual debt to God, the law? We have all sinned. We are debtors. Can we pay that debt? Can anyone pay that spiritual debt? We can't. So what do we do? We find one who can and who has paid that debt. And the first thing we do, one, surrender all to Jesus. And from that day, we choose never to sin again because it was our sin that made us debtors. That's the first step. No more sin, so now Christ can pay off the balance and clear the books. In the physical sense, today we must make a covenant with God. I will not borrow again. No more loans. I choose to get out of debt. Next, as God pays the spiritual debt, he will now give you wisdom, resources, and put you around others who can assist you to pay off the financial debt. If it makes sense, amen. amen? All right, let's close, friends. Here it is. You ought not to allow yourself to become financially embarrassed for the fact that you are in debt weakens your what? Faith. And tends to discourage you. And even the thought of financial debt makes you nearly what? Wild or what? Insane. Blue words. Don't falter. Don't be discouraged. Don't turn back. 
We are all, we were all debtors to divine justice. But we had nothing with which to pay the debt. Then the Son of God, who pitied us, let's read now blue words, everybody, pay the price of our what? Redemption. Praise God, brothers and sisters. Beloved, I was in financial debt over a hundred thousand dollars. Hillary didn't know how we would climb up out of it. But we determined never borrow, never take out loans, never again. Amen. Gave God our will, gave God our all. We were faithful with tithes and offerings. And brothers and sisters, I received a letter one day, paid in full. By whom? I don't know. I didn't check it. <laughs> that letter, I framed it. <laughs> if God can do it for one, he can do it for all. And let me tell you something again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, who today say, Lord, I have heard your words today. I'm convicted. I'm asking you to deliver me from debt, financial debt and spiritual debt. If that is you, raise your hand right now and send God the word. You want deliverance from that debt. Father in heaven, save us, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen.